take a look at mileage tracker. Um, we have declared our methods, written the method headers, written the documentation. The next step when it comes to defining a class is step number two here, which is defining the instance variables. Instance variables is a new concept for us. The instance variables are what store the object's attributes. So to connect this back to the turtle, um, instance variables in the turtle class, if we were to look at the source code of the turtle class, we would see that there is an X position, a Y position, a heading, a pen color, a Boolean for whether the pen is up or down. Those are the attributes of the turtle and their values are saved in what we call instance variables. Okay. So we're gonna define instance variables for our mileage tracker class. And the way we do this is we look at all the methods we have and we say what, what values are the need to be saved for a mileage tracker object. What are the attributes of a mileage tracker object? And as we look through this, we're like, well, we need to keep track of how many miles have been driven. So that's gonna be an instance variable. We need to keep track of how much fuel has been consumed. So that's gonna be an instance variable. Um, we also need those to calculate the mileage. So it's good that we have those as instance variables. And finally, we need to keep track of the vehicle identification so that needs to be an instance variable. So we're going to need three instance variables for our mileage tracker class. Now, when we declare our, an instance variable, we specify three words. Um, some similarities to when we do methods, but let's capture what those three words are. Yeah, question? Oh, sorry, sorry. There we go. Screen unfrozen, much better now for the other half of the room. All right, so let's say here are the three things that we specify when declaring an instance variable. First, we specify the visibility, which for instance variables are almost always private. Okay? We want our instance variables to have private visibility because that prevents other code and other classes from directly setting and getting their values directly. We need this for encapsulation. Encapsulation along with abstraction are like the two big ideas of defining classes. We want to require that other code calls our accessor methods and our mutator methods because often in more complicated examples, other code needs to run besides just updating the instance variable. And if we let other code directly change the instance variable, we don't have that opportunity and that's gonna to lead to issues. So that's why it's, we want our instance variables to be private. So it's probably worth taking a moment here just to capture like the difference between public and private because we use public primarily with our methods and private primarily with the instance variables. So public means it is accessible, accessible, by any code in any class. That's why we want most of our methods public. We want other code in other classes, like our test class, for example, to create new mileage tracker objects and call methods like get mileage. We want those things to be public. Private means that it is only accessible by methods in this class. And that's perfect for our instance variables and perfect for encapsulation. We only want direct access to our instance variables in the mileage tracker class, not any other code in any other class. So that's, that's what we want. The second thing we specify is we specify the type. For example, double or string. What is the, t just like when we declare a local variable, we specify the type. When we declare an instance variable, we specify the type as well. And then finally, the third thing we specify is the name. So for example, one of our instance variables we could call miles driven. The other we could call vin. So let's, let's declare our instance variables here so we can see like specifically what they look like. So we start with visibility, private. 
we start with the type of the variable, double for miles driven. And then I like to add a comment just to be really clear on what the, like if there are units with the value, what the units are. So in units of miles. That one's pretty clear. The variable's called miles driven. We need two others. Of type double, we'll have fuel consumed. And here I think the comment is more important to say in units of gallons. Otherwise, maybe someone thinks it's in units of liters. And that leads to bugs. Um, one of the early Mars rovers crashed because of confusion about units. Um, that's, that's a very costly mistake. And then our third one will be of type string. And we'll call it VIN. And that's the vehicle identification. So learning the syntax of how to define instance variables this is important. Visibility, type, name. But just as important is understanding how instance variables are different from the local variables we've been using this whole year. Okay. Um, you'll notice that when we declare our instance variables by convention, we do it at the top of the class. Um, we're, we're inside the mileage tracker class. Here's the bracket that starts it. But we're not inside any method. Instance variables are declared for the entire class, so they're outside of any method. That is like critically important. Um, there are some really important differences between instance variables and local variables. So let's capture these so they're all in like one place. And then we're going to see the impact of these as we go through um, some coding today. So instance variables differ from local variables in the following ways. And just to be clear, when I say local variables, I mean variables that we declare within a method. So when we wrote our test set bin method, here's a local variable, test tracker. Here's a local variable, test bin. Here's a local variable, return bin. Those are all local variables. So how do they differ? The most important and the whole purpose of instance variables is that instance variables are scoped to the class. When we use the word scope, with a programming language, what we mean by that is we mean that that variable is accessible in all methods of the class. So we can use this miles driven instance variable in all of the methods that we've written. Okay? It is accessible everywhere. It's defined for its use in any method in this class. That's what makes it an attribute of the class. Even perhaps more importantly, the lifetime is the same as the object. What we mean by lifetime is for how long does the instance variable remember its value. It remembers its value for as long as the object exists, which is like really important behavior. If we make a new turtle and we set the pen color to blue, we would hope that the turtle would remember that the pen color is blue for as long as that turtle lives. And that's exactly how instance variables work. Okay. They, don't go, they don't go away until the object goes away. So that is the most important difference between instance variables and local variables. Another more subtle difference is that instance variables are automatically initialized to a default value. And that default value is like zero if it's an int or a double, or false if it's a Boolean, or if it's a class type, it's a null, what we call a null reference. Meaning the value of this variable is null, it doesn't refer to an object. So if it's a string, like then here would be initialized to null, meaning the instance variable then doesn't refer to a string object yet. We can change that later, but initially it doesn't refer to a string object.
often with local variables, we don't have to, but often with local variables, we initialize them as soon as we declare them, right? So we're declaring test bin here as type string, and we're immediately assigning it a value. Best practice is not to do that with instance variables. So best practice is not to immediately initialize instance variables. Instead, we're going to initialize our instance variables in a special method called the constructor, and we'll do that in a moment. Um, can, can you initialize instance variables right here? Could I say equals seven? Yeah, I could. Um, and usually, it would work just fine. There are situations which we're not at the point in the course yet to understand the subtlety, um, but there are situations where it will not work fine. So we can avoid these potential issues just by always initializing our instance variables in the constructor, which we'll do in a moment, and not assigning any values here. Um, that way we don't have to worry about when we can and can't get away with it. We just will always do it one way and it just simplifies everything. So, so that's why we follow that, that recommendation. All right, we have three instance variables declared. We're about to initialize them. We have some insight into what makes these variables different than our local variables. This is a great, a great start. This isn't gonna help any of our tests pass yet. We've got some more code we need to write first. So, let's take a look at this next section which says define the constructors. What is a constructor? All right, so when we have this line of code here that says test tracker equals new mileage tracker, we know that the new operator goes off and creates a new object of the class mileage tracker and returns a reference to it. The other thing that happens automatically here is not only does it find some space in the computer's memory for this object, but it automatically initializes the object, and the method responsible for that initialization is what we call the constructor. So we're now going to write the constructor for our mileage tracker class. So here's what a constructor does. It is responsible for initializing newly created objects. This, um, this special method is invoked automatically via the new operator. So we will never like write a line of code that directly calls a constructor because it's always called automatically when we say new turtle automatically calls the turtle constructor. New string automatically calls the string constructor. <laughs> New mileage tracker is going to automatically call the constructor that we're about to write. The constructor is only ever called once for a given object. It's called to initialize it, and it will never be called again. Question? All right, so we initialize newly created objects. It's automatically called. Here's a rule in Java. Um, Java needs to be able to distinguish these special constructor methods from all the regular methods. And it depends upon two syntax clues to help it do that. The first is that the name of the constructor must match the name of the class. So the constructor for the mileage tracker class has to be called mileage tracker. And it has to start with a capital M as well. Like methods usually start with a lowercase letter by convention not the constructor, because it needs to match the name of the class exactly. The other syntax clue that Java relies upon to know that it's a constructor and not a regular method is that constructors, a constructor has no return type, not even void. Okay. So when we first learned about 
defining methods, we said, oh, we specify visibility, return type, method name, parameters. These are almost true for constructors, but we totally skip the return type. We don't even type void, we just leave it out. Java needs that syntax clue to know, oh, this is the constructor, and not just a method that happens to have the same name as the class. We can, and we will in a second here, we can define multiple constructors. Multiple constructors may be defined for a class. You've seen this when it comes to the turtle lab with the world. So originally we were just saying like ocean equals new world parentheses, and we got a new world object. But when you started doing the turtle lab, you, could, you saw how you could say new world and pass a width and a height to get a bigger world. That's a different constructor. So we can have constructors with different parameters so that we can initialize objects in different ways. That's super useful. And we're going to do a little example of that in just a moment. And then finally, this is just so that our notes are complete. We're going to come back to this concept later. But one constructor um, may call another constructor with some restrictions. I just want to throw that out there and mention it now. Later we'll revisit this and see how this works and what those restrictions are. Cool. So let's define a constructor. Just like we did for all of our other methods, we are going to write a java.comment block so that our constructors are documented when we generate our documentation. So we do that by doing slash star star and hitting enter to get a java.comment block. And we'll just have a, a basic description. What we're going to do first is we are going to, um, the first constructor we call the default constructor. So we'll just say that this first constructor is the default constructor for the mileage tracker class. The default constructor is a constructor that takes no parameters. Okay? So you can't specify any additional options. When you just say new world, and you just have the parentheses with nothing inside, you're calling the default constructor. In our test code here, we're saying new mileage tracker, and we just have the default, we just have the parentheses with no arguments here. That calls the default constructor. So let's describe, okay, well, what does the default constructor do? It initializes this object's miles driven and fuel consumed to 0, 0.0 and the VIN to null. Uh, I think that's a good description. So let's actually write the header for the constructor. We still have visibility. We still want it to be public. If it's not public, other code couldn't say new mileage tracker. So it's really important it's public. Um, we do not specify a return type. Instead, we specify the name of the class because that, that has to be the name of the constructor. And because this is the default constructor, we have the parentheses, but no parameters inside. So this constructor is responsible for initializing newly created objects, meaning it could do a variety of things, but at the very least, it should initialize the instance variables. Yes, these instance variables um, are automatically initialized to like default values, but it's we want to be really deliberate and communicative in our code. So even if we're going to set it to a value of zero, we still want to explicitly write the code for that just to make it, make it safe or make it clear. Um, so we could write code just like this, miles driven equals 0.0. .0. Okay. 
it Java will figure out that miles driven is an instance variable because it's clear that it's not a local variable. We didn't declare any here. And it's not a parameter variable because there are no parameters. So it's going to assume and then go look for it as an instance variable. When we refer to instance variables, however, if we just refer to them like this, it can lead to some bugs and we'll explore those more tomorrow. Um, so best practice is to always be explicit when we're referring to an instance variable to say, well, this variable is an instance variable for this object, the object whose code is currently running. Or in the case of the constructor, the object that we're initializing, we want to set this object's miles driven to zero. And the way we refer to that in Java, um, and I really like this aspect of Java, is with a special word. So the this reserved word references the current object. It is just like self, self in Python. Same idea. Its usage is encouraged, but not always required. Sometimes it is required. So here's another tip. Just always use this. Typing this dot is five extra characters. If you're consistent about using this, you're going to avoid potential bugs. Okay. Characters are cheap. They don't take long to type. I love the word this because if I'm implementing a method, whether it's a constructor or a normal method, and I might be struggling with like, wait, which objects miles driven do I want to change? Oh yeah, this object. Like it works out well just from like an English perspective. So let's initialize the other two variables. This dot fuel consumed equals 0.0, .0 and this dot vin equals null. That's what our constructor looks like. Now back to the example of why we're writing this class in the first case. We're a software engineer at BMW. Some other software engineers are working on the mobile app. We're writing this class just to do the mileage tracking. And these other software engineers are like, hey, this is great that I can create a new mileage tracker object. Very often, a lot of times, I'm going to have some initial miles driven and initial fuel consumed. So could I create a new mileage tracker object and specify those right away so I don't have to call the increment methods afterwards? We, we really like it if you could add that feature. So we're like, sure, we can do that because we can have multiple constructors for the same class. So let's write a second constructor that takes some parameters. Yeah, question? Excellent question. It knows that two ways. It knows it because the name of the method is the same as the name of the class. That alone isn't sufficient. Because if I write it like this with void, now it's just a method called mileage tracker. It is not a constructor. So Java knows it's a constructor because there is no return type. Leaving out that return type is what tells Java, hey, this is a constructor. And then Java's going to make sure the name matches too. Let's do another java.comment slash star star. And this one is going to give us some extra parameters so we can initialize things with different values. So this still constructs a new mileage tracker object, but now with the specified, specified miles driven and fuel consumed. So we're going to have two parameters. One parameter will be for the initial miles that were driven. Um, we have to give our parameters names. 
while you might be tempted to give it the same name as the instance variable, that can lead to some issues, which we'll see tomorrow. What I do to avoid those issues is I always prefix the parameters in my constructor with the word initial. So I'm going to call my parameter, and I'm going to document it this way, initial miles driven. And I'm going to say this is the number of miles already driven. And I'm going to document my second parameter, initial fuel consumed. And it's the number of gallons of fuel already consumed. And simply by giving them these unique names and this prefix of initial, I avoid a whole class of bugs that could pop up. So a lot of these best practices I'm sharing with you aren't required. They're just to help you proactively avoid bugs and common pitfalls that we would otherwise run into. All right, so let's declare this thing. We still start with public, visibility first, no return type. The name of the constructor still has to be mileage tracker. The way we distinguish it from the one we previously wrote is with the parameters. This is going to take two parameters of type double. The first we said we'd call initial miles driven. The second of type double we're going to call initial fuel consumed. And then in the body of this constructor, we're, going to initial, we're still going to initialize all three instance variables. It's just that the first two are now going to be initialized to whatever is specified here. So I can say this.miles driven. I don't want to hard code it to zero. I want to set it to whatever value is stored in the parameter initial miles driven. And same thing with fuel consumed. I don't want to hard code it to zero. I want to initialize it to whatever value is stored in the parameter variable, initial fuel consumed. And the VIN will still set to null. We're going to set the VIN later. If we really wanted to, we could write a third constructor. And the third constructor could take the miles driven, the fuel consumed, and the VIN if, if we thought that was useful. But the other software engineers who are using our class are like, no, this is good. We're going to always set the bin later. This is perfect. So we're just going to stop with two constructors. Excellent. So there's our two constructors.